I do. I really want to deal with some things in Ephesians chapter 4 tonight as a teacher tonight. Dog, I should have turned that heat off. Y'all hold on one second. You just hold, hold on one second. One second. circulating so I can be in good shape. Alright. So where is the air? Let's get the air circulating so I'll be alright. Cause I get hot when I'm having to do this here. I get hot. Alright, I'm sorry I'm back. But I think I want to mess with I really wanted to do um Ephesians chapter uh I really wanted to do Ephesians chapter 4 to show y'all a couple of things just on a teaching perspective tonight uh, and try to uh, just teach um, a couple of things from from the word of the Lord. So Ephesians 4, but I don't know why my spirit, I'm just, y'all go ahead and say a prayer for me for me to actually get what the Lord wants me to have. Because a lot of times, I, you know, it'd be something I want to do because I don't really want to do what the Lord wants me to do. Uh, I'd still have that struggle with him because some things don't always come off as easy as you would want them to. So, um, let, let's, let's, let's go to Ephesians 4 and see if I can. If he makes me change it, then I'll change it. But let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And as you know, I'm coming out of the King James I'm a King James girl, so let's skip over a few things in Ephesians chapter 4 and talk about a few things. So Ephesians 4 and verse 1, this is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, and so he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, you, he says, I beseech you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. So, He's having a conversation with them in um, literature form. He's writing to them and he says, listen, this is what I need to tell y'all. You need to make sure that you walk worthy of the vocation into which you are called. So I need to talk to a few people tonight that bear these callings, that have these callings on your life. Um, and a few of you that are trying to figure out whether you have a calling, you know there's something different about you, uh, and you're still trying to figure out how do I understand this call. Well, usually a charge to keep is a mandate. It's like something you just can't get away from. It's a situation like Jeremiah where it becomes fire that's shut up in your bone. It's literally like soon as you do something that you know is not right, you feel a conviction right at that moment. You start losing the taste and the desire for things things and you know that's part of the call but what the actual call is is what you have been summoned to do the conversion is all of the preparation that has to take place with the gutting and the cleansing and the the purification and all those are the steps with that like the water baptism and the infilling of the holy ghost that's the purging the calling is what it is that you have been summoned or petitioned or commissioned by god to do that's the calling. So then he's talking to them and he says, listen, this is what I need. To, I need to say to y'all. I need y'all to understand this, that you have got to. He starts out in verse one, Ephesians four and verse one. He says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. So he's he's indicating to them that I'm locked up in this. I'm, I'm locked up in this. Code. And so let me go ahead and say this to y'all. Anytime you deal with someone that's locked up in it. Anytime you deal with someone, hey, Tamika, anytime you deal with someone that is locked up in it, they have become a prisoner of living for the Lord, they are going to be the type of person that sometimes you're going to think, dang, man, they, they, yo, they just, man, they, they be pushing me too hard. You know what I'm saying? They, 
they, they, you know, they, they, they don't give me no break, man. It's like, you know, I try to talk to them about what I'm doing, you know, and they always coming at me about straightening this out and straightening that out and all, because that's what Paul was doing to them because he was preaching from, or he was sharing with them from a place of being a prisoner in the Lord. He said, I'm locked up in this now. So if you come to me about what I used to do, you just wasting your time because I'm locked up in this. I've now become a prisoner of the Lord. Yeah, I know you saw me when I was crucified and, you know, I was, I was, I was cussing the church and I was murdering the Christians and all. I know you saw all of that and I'm quite sure you know Paul became a single man in his time of serving the Lord but I guarantee you as a sinner man he had plenty of chicks. So I know you saw me running with the chicks and all and that's why the Lord didn't give him no chick when he started running for him because he had so many more than likely. That's my version of it. Um, Because I ain't ever seen sin let you be celibate. That's the reason why I said that. Sin don't usually let you be celibate. You know, I mean, there may be a few that can say, but uh, sin don't usually let you be celibate. Sin likes to fornicate. So, uh, you know, so I'm quite sure why he was killing people and had this bad nature about himself. He saw a few chicks he wanted to bump a little bit here and there, so I'm quite sure that he did. Well, now he's saying to them, I know you saw all that, but now I'm a prisoner of the Lord, and I need to talk to you about your vocation. I need to talk to you about your calling. That's what I need to talk to you about. I need to talk to you about that. I need to talk to a few of y'all that you know you ain't doing this stuff like you should be doing it I need to talk to you and I don't want to talk to you to make you think you're going to be perfect because you're not going to be perfect but you purposed okay please hear what I'm saying to you I can't ever make you think you're perfect because I'm not perfect but you are purposed All right. I need to talk to you from the purpose standpoint because when you let the purpose standpoint become bigger than your perfection standpoint that's when you got it That's when you got it. So he says, Ephesians 4 and verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. I don't know how many texts I'm going to get through. Y'all know how I am. When I break them down, I break them down. The prisoner of the Lord, he says, I beseech you that you walk worthy. You walk worthy. We're going to talk about that. Of the vocation wherewith you are called. So when he says to walk worthy, to walk worthy, please, don't misinterpret what he's saying. He's not saying that you you are worthy of anything because our righteousness is as of filthy rags, which means that what we think is righteous is usually, you know, what is right, but it's not always righteous. So he says that you walk worthy. So what that means is, is when I walk worthy of a vocation where when I am called, that means that Christ can look at me and Christ can be satisfied with me. That's what that means. That Christ can be satisfied with me. That Christ can be satisfied with me. I've now walked in a position or a place as to where Christ can be happy with what he's yielding out of me. That's what that's saying. So when there is a call on your life, can Christ look and say, I'm actually happy with what I see? I'm actually satisfied with what I see out of them. Can Christ say that? Can Christ say that? Verse 2, he says, with all lowliness and meekness, that's something we don't like, y'all, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. These are all of the qualifications that come with a calling. With lowliness and meekness is nothing but humility, which means that sometimes you've got to humble yourself. Sometimes, you know, you, 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 you just got to walk away from something. You know, sometimes you, you just got to be the bigger person, and sometimes you have to say, I'm sorry, when you ain't did nothing. That's humility. That's humility. Humility does not mean you're weak. Humility actually means you're strong because you are strong enough to know what steps you need to take in a situation. Weakness is when we feel as though we need to prove ourselves. That's when weakness shows up. But strength is when you can look at something and say, man, I'm going to let you have that. 
You 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 can have that. You can go on and say what you want to say. I'm gonna let you have that, man. That is where strength comes in. That is where you see meekness and you see lowliness. That's why he says the meek shall inherit the earth. That's pay attention to that's in Matthew 5. The meek shall inherit the earth. So with meekness and lowliness. And with long suffering. Long suffering, all that means is exactly what it says. It means to suffer long. Long suffering, to suffer long. Now, when we see stuff like this right here, when we think of the word long, when long is in front of suffering, automatically in the mind, the mind starts to say, dang, that must mean I got to put up with that for a long time. Gosh, but baby, let me ask you a question. What is a long time? What is a long time? For the Bible says that a day is as of a thousand years with the Lord. So what is a long time? What is a long time? What is a long time? So when you see that, that's automatically what we think because of the way our minds have been conditioned. Our minds have been conditioned to the point where we misinterpret a lot of words. We don't get the full context out of a lot of words because of the way they have been presented to us. So it says long suffering, but how much, how, how, can anybody say how, how much time long is? Long suffering. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If you have a, a, let's say a toothache, if you have a toothache, if you've been, if that toothache is hurting you, I mean, profusely, it's hurting you and it hurts you consistently for 30 minutes, you're going to be hollering, this going on too long. This is going on, uh, 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 somebody get, look, 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 get me to the hospital. This has gone on too long. I, I can't take this. This hurts. This, this, it's just been too long that this is happening, but it's only been 30 minutes. So in your mind, because of the amount of suffering that you are going through, that means that you think that's a long time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is a long time. Well, how much, how much time is, goes with long? So it says long suffering. He knows that. Let me tell you how you can cut some long suffering. Let me give y'all a wisdom nugget. Of how you can cut long suffering. You can cut the time in long suffering. If you submit. And bring yourself to the place. That the Lord wants you to come to. Suffering doesn't have to be as long as you. Would think that it is. A lot of times the suffering that we go through. In life is because of some consequences. That we have. But if we be the type that say, you know what, I'm sorry about what I did, you know, if we're willing to humble ourselves, willing to bring ourselves to a low place, that can cut the suffering. You know, even in the court system, even in the natural world, if you tell the truth about something, they have what they call mercy in the courtroom or they give a leniency in the courtroom. Throw yourself on the mercy of the court is what they say. And then so that so the time can be cut. You know, with your own children, when your kid would tell the truth about about the situation, something about your heart shifted in the amount of punishment that you would give them. But if they lied to you, then that made you want to give an extra amount of punishment. So therefore, that's what you can cut long suffering by just being honest. You don't have to suffer as long. That's just a free nugget I gave you right there. How you know that, Pastor Lee? Because I don't had to cut a lot of mine because I just had to tell the truth about it. That's how I know. He says, I'm in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. He says, forbearing one another in love. Forbearing, forbearing one another in love. So that means that I am, there's going to be some difficulties that's going to arise with us sometime. But my forbearing in love, forbearing, if I've come to you with love in front of anything else, that'll get us through the problem. The forbearing means to present ahead of time, to come to, I didn't come to you in anger. I didn't come to you in malice. I didn't come to you with a preconceived notion. I'm forbearing in love. I'm coming in love. And so love is what's going to cause us to find a common denominator. I want y'all to think about all of this. Now, you know, I'm a truth teller. I, 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 I'm going to do the real talk about it. I want y'all to think about this. I talk life. This is what's happening. If you go to somebody or if somebody it comes to you and they come with hell in them what do you usually do what do you usually do it's usually a retaliation right back at them with the same way that they came right 
But if they come in forbearing in love, even if it's something that there is a disagreement about, but they come in a forbearing in love, can I talk to you for a minute? You know, I, I, you know, I don't want any discrepancies between us. I don't, you know, I don't want us to have a falling out or anything, but there is something that I need to talk to you about. There, um, something you said, something you did, or what have you, that I need to talk to you about. See, that's a forbearing in love. And so he's telling them, if you have handle it and conduct it from that manner, then you won't have as many problems to arise. Verse 3, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, he says, endeavoring, verse 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. 